let's see well uh let's let's dive into thinking with types then if i well is, so what's the order that or polysem what was first or was that part of working with it or are they kind of uh, related to each other thinking with types came out first mm -hmm. yeah okay so yeah. so how was how was writing thinking with types right that was your first book right it was great it was so much better than this last one <laughs> <laughs> so the first one was easier yeah uh, so I, I had quit my job in late, uh, early 2018, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I had always promised that myself I, when I retired, I'd move to Lithuania um, for reasons I don't really know. Uh, so I, I moved to Lithuania. <laughs> so how, so how, how do you pick Lithuania, right? Why, like, did you know somebody? Did you read something? Like, was it, because uh, I, I live in Romania, which is not very far, right? So I kind of know right. the area. So I'm wondering yeah. how, how did you get to pick Lithuania? Why, why? that in, uh, in particular so a few years ago maybe i guess 10 years ago now i met some woman at a conference and she had invited me to come visit her in estonia okay uh, which i had never heard of before <laughs> fair enough um, so I, I i looked up where it was and i was okay great <laughs> so i uh, i hopped on a plane to come visit and we like really didn't hit it off um, <laughs> okay. which is a bit of a shame because i had like four months to to just travel and i started in <laughs> estonia and like she and i didn't hit it off so i from Estonia, there's not a lot of places you can go. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I headed south, and just when I got to, to Vilnius in Lithuania, I, I loved it. It was the first city I'd ever been to that, like, really, truly felt like home. Um, cool. So my, my plan was to stay for three days, and I spent for, like, three weeks accidentally there. <laughs> Accident. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so so uh, when I quit my job, I promised myself I was going to return to Lithuania. Mm -hmm. And did, um, but sort of found it socially quite difficult. Um, Lithuania is quite a post-Soviet country still. Okay. And uh, the, the culture is not the Canadian culture that I'm familiar <laughs> with. <laughs> so I, I was having a hard time making friends. And, you know, I made it a few excellent ones. But, you know, when they're busy, what, what do you do, right? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's hard to make a lot of friends, right? Yeah, in exactly. a new place, and like when you're not a kid anymore, and so on, right? So, <laughs> and also when you don't speak the language, I think. Oh yeah, cool. of course, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, so I was in, inside a lot and was writing. Just wanted to write a book. It was going to be about my life, and, and I realized nobody cared. Nobody wants to read that book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and so uh, someone had suggested that I write a book on type level stuff because I was doing that on my blog anyway. Okay. And I realized like all of this knowledge exists, but it's not it's not coalesced anywhere, right? Yep. Yeah, so, there, there's definitely a lack of intermediate to advanced level Haskell books, right? Yeah. We have a, quite a few uh, beginner books, but not very very few, if any, uh, intermediate level, right? Right. Um, so, like, I didn't do any. I didn't. There's nothing new in that book, right? It's just all the blog posts I'd read over five years and had internalized. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, when you write, do a project like that, you can't cite it because it sort of turns into folklore in your brain. <laughs> and it's, you don't know where any of it came from. Um, but yeah, yeah so that, that project was just me being bored in Lithuania. Uh, and so it took maybe three or four months, which was unbearably short. <laughs> but it, was, it was amazing how quickly it got out the door. Uh, yeah, so that's, I guess, how Thinking of Types happened. Okay, so I, I guess, like, compared to um, this, the, the newer one, Algebra-Driven Design, it's different because you already knew exactly what you were going to write, right? It's a yeah. sort of tutorial, ex like examples, how to do this type level thing, right? So, yeah, it, it makes sense that like, it was easier to write, right? I mean, like, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so Vince is saying that you were trying to work out, uh, was, it aims at inter was it aimed at intermediate or advanced, would you say? Thinking with types? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was aimed at anyone, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, it was just all the things I knew that I could put into a book. Yeah. Um, it was clearly not a book for beginners. Yep, for sure. And you I, need I, to be I, familiar I, with Haskell syntax and like the, the basics, yeah. for sure. It's It's been a while since I've, I've re-looked at it, but I think there's a, a phrase in there saying, um, you should be able to solve real life problems in Haskell before even thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Because uh, because they'll help prevent errors, but uh, they'll make it harder for you to do that, right? And like that yeah. the simplest thing possible, at least initially, right? It will be harder to write. It's yeah, absolutely, yeah. 
I think these things have benefit, but it takes some wisdom to decide when to use them. Yeah. And the benefits yeah. are usually later, right? Not immediately. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I, I, I think that wisdom comes just with experience and exposure. Uh, and mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to overload sort of beginners too often with too much. Yeah, so again, I guess the answer to that, Vince, is it really depends on how you define intermediates, right? Is it just after you've, you've done reading the, like, Haskell from first principle? Then probably not, right? You probably need to do some, a few projects in between. Uh, if intermediate is somebody who's been working with Haskell for a year or two or something and has, like, is already right, like, as a full-time job, then yeah, sure, that, that's definitely easily within their reach to, to, to start doing that, that sort of thing. Actually, I think the, the way I phrased it was... Um... If you're still fighting with with Haskell, if the type checker is giving you problems, then this is not the book for you. Oh, yeah. But if you would like the type checker to give you more problems, uh, <laughs> then, then you should use it, right? And I, I think that's a good distinction, right? If at some point we all seem to embed the Haskell type checker in our brains, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I, I think that's sort of the core Haskell skill is being able to type check things just in your head. Well, I mean, since uh, we were, apparently we we're getting a team to this uh, podcast, because last week Assad was saying something like it took him a long time to learn category theory because he was doing all the side quests instead of doing the main quest line, right? And I thought that was right. a, like a great uh, way to phrase it, right? Because it was immediately clear. And then again, you're kind of doing the same thing here. So you're kind of like turning on hard mode for, for the type checker, right? <laughs> We're thinking with types, <laughs> right? So if you if you think it's too, you're having a too easy time with the type checker, <laughs> try thinking with types. <laughs> uh, cool. So let's see. There's a few more questions. So let's see. Uh, Jonathan Lorimer said, to be fair, some of the early chapters in thinking with types were very lucid explanations of beginner topics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like contravariance and all of that. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, the, the beginner chapters can definitely help beginners as well, like beginner to intermediates. Right. Okay. Um, where you put place it on the Haskell ladder thingy? Uh, what Haskell ladder is it? The, the one that Chris Penner linked with the like? Uh, I don't really remember what what you mean. Sorry. Uh, how the type checker is in my head. <laughs> okay, uh, and. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so Vince is saying that, yeah, I think the, it felt like intermediate. It started as intermediate and then moved on to advanced as the chapters went on. Yeah, probably the, like the later chapters are things that you uh, can it be considered like advanced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. OK. Um, so how, how, how do you feel the book was received? Are, are you, are you, like, do you consider it was uh, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, what are your feelings after having written Thinking with Types? Uh, I am amazed at the support it's gotten. Uh, it's it's incredible. I didn't realize there were this many Haskellers in the world. Uh, <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that because I I, I I wasn't sure what, what what the reception was. I just uh, uh, yeah okay. But that's... Yeah. At, at some point, I'd reached out to Chris Allen um, asking mm -hmm. sort of roughly how much I could expect to make writing a book. Mm -hmm. Um, he was quite coy and didn't give me any numbers, but uh, <laughs> he, what he said is, if you're if you're interested in how much money you're going to make, you're writing it for the wrong reasons, which I thought was a like an exceptionally good answer. Yep, fair enough. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, the support has been fantastic. Um, it's and it's to be honest, it's a little embarrassing on my part because. If I had known how many people were going to read this thing, I definitely would have put more effort into it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back now and I'm like quite embarrassed by a lot of the chapters where it's just like, oh, like, I guess that's sort of natural, right? As, as yeah, we get older, wiser and better, um, our past work, I, I think it's natural for it to be embarrassing. And it's also important to release things, right? Because otherwise you, you end up never releasing anything. And it's better to release something and have people learn and read and maybe even criticize and get some feedback and like see some blog posts and that. But it's still definitely a huge net plus for, for the community and, and everybody, right? It's, even if it's not perfect, because it can't ever be perfect, right? So Yeah, that, that was actually a big part of how I got the book out. I realized after a few months of working on it, I was just tired and didn't want to be working on it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, I'm going to release this on November 7th, no matter what. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's amazing what a deadline will do, right? It, all of a sudden you need to prioritize of editing and what material should and shouldn't be in there. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so I actually did the same technique with this, uh, with this last book, Algebra Driven Design, of just, it wasn't ready and I'd been working on it for too long. And I realized <laughs> I'm just, I need to release this or it's never going to happen. So. <laughs> So yeah, I, I strongly recommend that as a technique to anyone. <laughs> yeah, I think a couple of people were telling you on Slack to go sleep because you're trying it. You're, you're into like your 14, 16 hour. <laughs> I need to get this done. You're like, okay, maybe we need a, a few hours of sleep before continuing. Yeah, I remember that. But yeah, I, I definitely deadlines work for sure. Um, so let's see. We have a couple of other things here. Oh, so checks are asked how long did you spend working on each of your books? I think I already mentioned that, but uh, like, and they ask if it if it's getting easier. <laughs> but I think you already uh, said that the second one was harder, right? <laughs> when you get to the point where you know what to write, it becomes very easy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the writing is the easy part, and it's the figuring out what to write, which is what gives me issues. Um, I'm, I'm quite good at just sitting down and like getting ideas out. Um, so this last one, uh, just pulling up the numbers here, it took uh, 15 work days, or like 15 full days of writing and research. Mm -hmm. So times that by 24 is like how much effort I put into it. Um, and it was over the span of a year. So that actually doesn't sound like too much when I think about it. Like that, <laughs> <but>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess I definitely right because uh, the first that's probably why you, you felt you feel like it, the second one was harder, right? Because you didn't know exactly what has to go in there, and you even changed your mind a couple of times, right? You you restarted started from scratch, whereas with the first one, I I don't think you've ever started from scratch, right? You kind of like maybe you maybe you re reworded a few phrases here and there, of course, and things like that, but definitely you, you knew what you wanted to say, right? And it right. there's not much much uh, going back and forth with that, yeah. Um, cool. So let's see. Well, before we go back to, to FP, like, uh, I mean, I was going to say well, what, what else do you want to share about who Sandy is, but, uh, <laughs> you've already said that you're doing 14 hours FP. So do you do anything other than FP? Uh, I try to play a lot of music. Uh, I'm not cool. particularly good at it. Um, but uh, so I do you play instruments or okay, bass guitar? Yeah, I, I, I play piano at quite a high level. Um, and then I bought a guitar five years ago and like can rock a campfire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no one will ever say, "Wow, that man is a good guitar player." Um, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. it, it's you're good enough for it to be fun, right? That's what it, what it matters. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, you, yeah. And it's amazing how much better you get when something becomes fun, right? <laughs> when you start just doing it for its, for its own purpose. Um, and then recently I realized I wanted to play more music with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I and, and whenever I play music with people that we never have a bass guitar. <laughs> of course. Right. It's, it's not the, <laughs> like the shiny instrument. So most people like, no, you'll have like five guitarists on one, one pi pi pianist on one drummer and then no bass player, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I realized I should, I should be the change I want to see in the world. Right. <laughs> Cool. Um, bass guitar is great because you don't like a very low amount of skill really helps a band. Yep. Right. Uh, you, uh, you just play a couple notes that uh, you you play four notes a bar compared to guitar where like you have to be working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and like you're more appreciated and more sought after. It's like why would why would why doesn't everybody do this? Right. Yeah, definitely. Like if the goal is to uh, to to play with other people, then yeah, definitely yeah. pick up like drums or bass or something yeah. like that yeah i guess it doesn't come with the, the prestige um everybody wants to be the rock star but <laughs> i don't care <laughs> that's that's cool i think a lot of uh, fpers that i know do play some sort of instrument it's uh yeah it's interesting yeah um I, so there's that uh i also try to do like a huge amount of reading i'm trying to read like a book a week um and have been for the last couple of years cool uh, yeah so uh, that's just to keep me fresh, I guess. But, so yeah, besides, those are the big activities in my life. Okay, so do you mind sharing like what, what kind of books do you, do you read or? All over the map. All over um, the map, so not, not something specific. No, uh, so like last year I read, um, the top books I read last year were uh, the Elon Musk biography, which I thought was fantastic. Um, and then The Art of Doing Science and Engineering by Richard Hamming, which is sort of on how to build a good career, how to build like a meaningful mm -hmm. life career which i am told from sort of the perspective of a mathematician okay. um, and then but then there's also like i'll read um like young adult fiction 
right? Because okay. you can't <laughs> always be reading heavy things if you want to go to bed. At oh yeah, point. sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to have some like books about dragons just so I can get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Just to like disconnect, right? And uh, like yeah, uh, exactly. cool down the brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I, my brain gets too power, too excited, and just like I cannot sleep if there's big ideas going on. Uh, so yeah. I, I just really need that unwinding. Yeah, I, I, I definitely get that because I'm also like also have days where I work like 14, 16 hours where I do like mm-hmm. the, the job, the, the day job. And then I do like Haskell and do some like Haskell type level exercises on stream. And then I'm like, OK, I need to unwind for a bit. Right. So yeah. but but for me, I, I do some I, I watch some Twitch. <laughs> right. That's why I, 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 I do a good amount of that as well. But, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just like amazed by your energy. Flat. I don't know how you how you manage. So just want to give you props, man. It's like this. Uh, this podcast you've been putting on has been excellent so far. Oh, thank, thank you, Just thank you very much. Daily, like you're streaming every day, right? Well, I started doing that for like a month and then I was like, okay, I, I need to spend some time with the wife in the evening, right? Because yeah. <laughs> that, that's not going to be to end up well. So uh, I'm taking like Wednesdays, I'm totally off. And then Saturdays, it's um, it's later usually, but I, I might like, it's not no promise that I stream every Saturday. Okay. But yeah, yeah other hey, than I just that, still, yeah. the work you've been doing lately. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. That that means a lot coming from you. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, okay, right. So we we got in. Okay, so let's see. Actually, I think I've seen some some comments in chat. Give me one second. I need to get better at reading them before reading them out loud because sometimes people troll me and I read silly <laughs> I read I read silly things <laughs> without even thinking about it. Right. Uh, so let's see. Um, So has it gotten harder because you know there is more of an audience than you expect, so you're giving it more effort? So I think this was asked when you were talking about the great uh, support you've received for thinking with types, right? Um, I don't think so. I don't know if it's gotten harder. Um, really, like first and foremost, I'm, I'm making these things for me. And if other people like them, that's amazing, but I I'm not really thinking about that. Um, so it sort of helps keep me grounded because when I start thinking like, oh, people are interested in my work, like it goes to my head and <laughs> my ego is big enough already without that. <laughs> um, so let's see, how did you deal with the brain melt you described where you don't have people in, in real life uh, which uh, with which to talk about interesting topics? What would you say? Uh, what would you do if you couldn't move? I wish I had an answer to that. Um, <laughs> I mean, like FP Slack goes a, a, some amount of the way, right? Mm-hmm. Just having a community where people care about these things helps. And it's not a substitute, but it it alleviates the pain. And it's also easier because you don't have one person to ping and then maybe they're busy, maybe. So you, you like you, right. a number of people yeah. could answer, right? And start a dialogue. Yeah. That, that's Absolutely. cool. I, I love that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, I mean, Ottawa was really hard because it, it's just entirely policy. And I'm sure there's interesting questions in policy, but I don't care about them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I really don't have an answer to that. In other cities, it helps to just meet anybody in tech or anybody who's sort of interested in math, even if it's not the same stuff mm-hmm. you're doing, because at least um, at least you can grow in, in ways that you want to in, with those people. Sorry, but there should be some sort of like CS math-based university in Ottawa, isn't there? Or- like, I don't know, uh, but I, I think there should be, right? Because it's, uh, it's a pretty big place. <laughs> you just don't know the right, I guess. Maybe. I, I would like, I would trawl through the, the lists of faculty at a university mm-hmm. saying, like, is there anybody whose research looks even remotely interesting? And, um, you know, I probably missed some people, but for the most part, I was quite disappointed. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, not to throw the, the city under the bus or anything, <laughs> but it, it, was, it was not the place for me. Yeah, yeah sure. I get it. So. Uh, that being said, I've, all, I've had a lot of success during COVID, like just reaching out to old people I used to live in proximity to. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of my friends from university, uh, especially like the math nerds that I haven't stayed in touch with, um, it's been really great to reacquaint myself with them because uh, they their brain works similarly but differently. <laughs> and it's, it's a really refreshing change of pace. Yeah, like p- people who do math, like a lot of math, because I, I have my wife who's uh, who's a math PhD. She she teaches at a local university. She does like computer science, usually courses and things like that. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, right? Because it's um, 
like they get used to, especially at that level where you do math research and so on you, you get used to thinking abstractly so much that you don't even need examples which i find absolutely yeah. amazing right because like she, she, I, I, yeah it's terrifying because exactly. she was like oh wait what's a monad and i like, oh it's a and i kind of did a joke or it's an end of functor and oh okay <laughs> like, wait no that never worked before ever <laughs> right or, or like what, what, what's a class well it's, it's an arrow in the like this sort of uh, embellished category oh okay and that's the end of the story. And then she's able to use them in pure script, right? Which is absolutely amazing wow. to me, right? And like, how, how do you do that, right? How do you write the code? Yeah. Like, and she's like, ah, it's, I don't know. I just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely amazing what, uh, what people can do when they, 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 they train their brain to think abstractly, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, because that, that's, um, a, that's a muscle you, you need to develop, right? It's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely yeah, not, I, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So it's not one I think that computer scientists are good at, right? Because we like to have code in front of us, and we like to be able to run things and sort of um, maybe like like build our own examples, right? From code, even if it's code we've written. Yeah. Um, but I, I was working my way through a Wody's category theory book, and in it has like one of the sorry, the, which category book? I, I that didn't. Uh, Steve Awody wrote. Oh, a book okay, okay, category. I know it, I know it. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's in it. It's like one of the worst sentences I've ever read. <laughs> I'm sure the man is brilliant, but he doesn't write a good sentence. Um, and so the, the, it took me probably 15 minutes to parse what the <laughs> sentence was like, even like ignoring the math. <laughs> just the, like, okay. Just like the English part of it, like what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I would always like point this to people being like, you know, category theories, it's, they're brilliant, but like, can they communicate? Uh, yeah, then, but even yeah. like the, 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 the category theory Bible, right? McLean is notoriously hard to read yeah. as well. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I pointed it to like a mathematician and he, he looked at it. And he's like, oh, yeah, that, that, that's a true theorem. <laughs> so what? How did you do that? He's like, well, I just substituted in these functions in my brain and then it worked. And so I assumed it must work for everything. So, okay, right? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's just remarkable. So uh, the other thing that, that amazes me by mathematicians is that for the most part, they, they don't have type systems, right? Yeah. Those guys are thinking about everything in terms of real numbers. <laughs> Almost always. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, they always like collapse things. Okay, yeah, that's, you, you can assign a number to each of the, and like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like even, even the numbers that they create don't have semantic value, right? Uh, they'll say like, oh, I got this number that is inches and I have this number that's plants and I'll like multiply, I'll add them together. Uh, and I'll get the right answer, even though there, as far as I can tell, there's no semantic meaning. They're completely <laughs> playing at maybe what feels to me like the wrong level of abstraction. Um, but that being said, these guys are getting you know more work done mathematically than I am. So who am I to speak? Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, another thing that has uh, like kind of the pile on what you were saying that has uh, surprised me a lot is that people, when people think a lot very abstractly, they don't need examples. Like not only do they not need it, but they sometimes even don't know how to f make examples. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was trying, I think I've said this story before, but I was trying to figure out the, uh, like a, like my office was working on a paper and I was like, I'm trying to figure out what what the, the gist of it was. And I, I'm kind of getting it from the abstract uh, explanation. I was like, okay, give me an example. <laughs> and she looked, I, I, I'll never forget the look that she gave me in that moment when I asked for an example. Like she looked at me like some sort of idiot or something, right? Like, what do you mean? Like, why do you need an example? <laughs> right? And I'm like, no, sorry, I need to, I need to, to run them, them like the, I have a mental model and I need to type check it or, or run it or execute yeah. it with an example, right? So, but no, apparently they don't do, they don't need that. I don't know how that, how their brain works, but they don't need that. I don't know, it, but it would be fascinating to find out. I don't know what what are the right questions to ask of these people, but I bet you if we if we if we spend enough time, we could get it out of them. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you can definitely finally get it, but it's it's not trivial, right? You right. you, you kind of need to understand what they're saying as opposed to, and they usually seem to have a hard time understanding what we're saying for some reason. Mm -hmm. Maybe or maybe I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not as the... clear as we think. Maybe this <laughs> maybe is how it's the not. Yeah. guys feel when we talk about these things. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, except for Assad. He's the, he's the one JavaScript guy I'd expect to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's see. Uh, let's see other things. So I think I, I missed a question. I think at some point you mentioned one of the books you're reading, uh, the one from the perspective of, of a mathematician, and I think people didn't yeah. hear the name. C can you repeat the name? Oh, that, that book is called The Art of Doing Science and Engineering okay. by Richard Hanning. Yeah. 
Uh, and I, it's it's probably the most inspirational book I've ever read. Okay. Uh, Richard Hamming is this guy who worked at Bell Labs and is sort of famous for error correction codes and filter theory. And, um, but in particular, he was famous for sitting down at uh, just random strangers' tables and asking them what the most important problem in their field was. Okay. And they tell him, and then he'd ask, what are you working on? And inevitably it would not be the same thing. And he'd say, why are you not working on the most important problem? <laughs> and so as you can imagine, he didn't make a lot of friends doing that. I was going to say, yeah. He was a but blessed at parties. Said, yeah, but like his name is remembered and a lot of mm -hmm. these other people at Bell Labs aren't. So I think Ooh, there might enough. be something something there, right? So um, the, the, the gist of the book... <laughs> is he wrote it near the end of his life talk, just as a reflection on his career. And mm -hmm. um, he repeats a Louis Pasteur quote several times, uh, which is that luck fortune, luck favors the prepared mind. Okay, yeah. And so a lot of the book is about how can we just be prepared for like when inspiration strikes or... Um, so he, he looks at a lot of his, his past successes and a couple of his failures. Um, and for example, he like he had the realization of the fast Fourier transform um, a okay. few weeks before it got published, <laughs> and he realized like he wasn't prepared to work on that problem. But um, if he had put in a, a week of work when that happened, it would be called the, the fast Hamming transform, right? <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> and enough. he kicks himself to this day. And so a lot of it is sort of like, how can you not make the same mistakes I made? Okay. Um, it's, it's a marvelous book, and I would strongly recommend it to anybody uh, in our field. Uh, so I, I think it was, he said this when, uh, when you're saying that he was telling people at parties that they should work on the most interesting book, uh, sorry, yeah. problem. He said, well, what a dick. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's see. Um, Asad says, okay, we should get your wife on the podcast. Yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, so, and then Agent Ultra saying, um, Sandy, hi about the new book. Was Algebra Different Design something you discovered and pulled together in retrospect or something that you've been working on with several projects uh, now? Um, I think that's asking, like, is this, uh, is this distilled something from you, you, Something you've this. discovered now or something that you've been working on for a while or different projects, I think, is the... This is something I've discovered now. And with the new lens, now that I know about it, when I look back, I see a lot of it in projects I really respect. Um, but no, it, this was this was just the the toil of putting in hours and reading papers and like really digging in um, and then trying to apply to my own work. But it's 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 quite a novel idea to me. Cool. And we've covered this a bit earlier, right? When we were saying that you've yeah. rewritten it a few times and <laughs> gotten to, 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 to this place, right? Started as something else. Uh, yeah. I wish I had discovered this because I, oh, I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. So let's see. Give me one second, please. Right, so what other, other, do we have any other questions in chat? I'll, I'll look at the my list of questions, meanwhile. <laughs> yeah, Agent Rural says, I feel the same way about all of ideas I've come across. Yeah, yeah, you kind of work your way through uh, <laughs> through problems and find, yeah, find interesting things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing how brilliant just everybody is right um when you just start diving in and reading papers not for the results but for the methodology mm -hmm. i think that's where a huge amount of sort of insight and power comes from because when you're good at these things you don't think about writing about it right it's, it's just the way that you operate um, okay. but that's the stuff that's really teachable right that's the stuff that has value because it's reproducible is the, the methodology rather than the results. I mean, th that's valuable in the sense of helping others produce interesting things, right? But it's also very valuable to, to teach people something, even if it doesn't help them to like to build something new, right? Because you're talking some talking about some sort of meta teaching, right? Where meta uh, mm. things, right? But also the, like the, literally learning about types with thinking types is very useful to a lot of people, right? So that's true. Yeah. 
I think both uh, are yes, interesting it's, it's, things, it's, right? If you want to create new ideas, I think mm -hmm. these are the valuable things. Um, and I imagine this is what research does for you in academia. I don't know. I've never been there. Um, <laughs> well, me, me either. I just have some like some idea from from what I see, right? Uh, right. In my family. Um, okay, cool. So uh, since we're on this subject, Assad is asking, are there any specific organizational techniques you use? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Like, I, I think things like uh, how do you organize your ideas into, uh, like, do, do you write them down somewhere? Do you use like electronic uh, formats or uh, like okay. notebooks and things like that? I think that's what he means. I'm not 100% okay. sure. Um, I tried doing the, the Zettelkasten mm -hmm. thing while and i got really excited about it for a few weeks okay <laughs> and then I, I i don't know if this the software is terrible or i don't care enough um <laughs> i tried that for a while and it was it got me thinking a lot more um but ultimately sort of fell flat for me um so organizationally i i do a lot of thinking in code mm -hmm. and so i'll usually prototype ideas and um, then work backwards from there of uh, how can I apply these techniques? What what sort of things do I build up with them? And then try to do retrospectives on that. So I don't know if there's a lot of organization necessarily there. It's it's not a thing I'm well known for. Um, <laughs> that being said, there is a, is a program I, I strongly recommend called Zotero, which tracks your citations. Okay. Uh, so I, that thing is amazing. You can like give it um, DOI references and it'll like magically find PDFs for you. <laughs> And, uh, and then it generates like BibTeX and just does all of the hard part of bibliographies. Cool. So that, that thing is amazing. And I wish I had known about it years ago. 